All right, so I guess I'll start. Good evening, everyone. My name is Abhishek Jain, and I'm pleased to invite you all to the second episode of the Vacation Scheme series by Planty. Towards the end of this session, we will also be having a Q&A session for which I would request you all to put your questions in the live chat box. Today, we are very fortunate to have with us Aditya Sarma, a graduate of the 2018 batch of NUJS. He was offered a vacation scheme at Allen and Overy in 2017 and is currently working as a member of the banking and leverage finance team at Allen and Overy. In this session, Aditya will be speaking in detail on the application process for a vacation scheme at Allen and Overy, as well as the opportunities that are available both during and after the completion of the same. I would now like to hand it over to Aditya to begin the session. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks a lot for that introduction, Abhishek. That's very kind of you. Um, first of all, a, a huge thank you to you and your team um, for organizing this session and for being so patient um, <laughs> with accommodating my uh, schedule. It's, I, can, I can imagine it's been a bit of a pain um, trying to actually <laughs> set up the final date. But thank you for um, making sure that the whole thing goes ahead. Um, and I just also want to say that what you guys are doing, um, I've obviously had looked through, um, you know, the various episodes you guys have had and will have in the future. And I think it's really cool and it's really interesting what you're doing, because at the end of the day, I think awareness is crucial when it comes to, you know, LLMs or um, corporate internships, litigation um, internships, and, and, you know, the whole gamut of options you have as a law student. So yeah, very well done. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Hopefully um, people can take away a few key points about vacation schemes and what they really are and understand what goes into the whole process. Um, so just as a bit of background, as Abhishek said, um, I'm currently an associate with the banking and leverage finance team at Allen Overy or a &O. Um, I did my training contract. Oh, well, I did my sum. I did. I participated in the summer vacation scheme uh, in 2017, summer 2017. So that would be July 2017 in the UK. And once that was done, I was offered um, a training contract, which is essentially, to those of you who don't know, a two-year training program with the firm. And this is something that is mandatory in the in the UK. Um, so when you start out, when you start your legal career, you tend to do two years of training in um, most firms. There is a slight exception to this, and I, I might get into that later on. But the general uh, the, the, the general principle is that you do two years of training in um, in a firm, and typically you do uh, you do four seats, which is divided into six month seats and you know at the end of it you you may choose to qualify to become an associate within that firm or another firm or you might you know choose to do something completely independent and that's something i'll speak to later as well um so i guess the real it, it really starts off with a vacation scheme and what that is about now First of all, what is a vacation scheme? It's it's a bit of a fancy word, um, but in all honesty, it's 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 not very different from an internship, as you have them um, at various corporate law firms in India. But at the same time, there are a few crucial differences which are important in understanding what it's really about, and you know when you're applying to them, and when you're actually you know going through the um, process of filling out the form and when you're actually at the firm for the vacation scheme. So the first thing to, the first thing I guess, which you should know is who is eligible to apply. And the nice thing about vacation schemes is that as such, they are open to everyone. Um, typically, however, you would have individuals who are in the fourth year of their five year law degrees applying. Um, and this is more so in the case of India, where you do tend to have specialized law programs. Um, and there have been instances, however, where you have people who are in the second year of their three-year law degree apply. 
Um, so yeah, that is quite a mix. However, typically the weightage is given to those in their fourth year of a five-year law degree program. Um, in terms of which firms come down for vacation schemes, now historically there have been there have been four firms which used to come down. Well, which used to come down. Of these three, still do. So ANO, where I work, is is a firm which continues to have a strong presence in India, both from a business point of view and from a recruitment point of view. Um, Linklaters and Herbert Smith Freehills are the other two firms. I believe, and this is quite some time ago now, but I believe Clifford Chance used to come down to hire as well, but they have um, they've stopped since a long time. It's possible they might come down in the future, um, you know, but that's still something which we don't know yet. You might also see um, U.S. firms come down in some time, um, you know, and that that'll be an interesting development. U.S. firms are sort of they're now moving out of their traditional market, which is the U.S. Um, so it will be interesting to see how they expand through Asia. At the moment, though, the um, the British firms, I think, still in terms of a recruitment market, definitely by and by do dominate um, the people who are sort of who are going for vacation schemes. Um, when do these applications normally tend to open? Now, some of this information may be out of date, and I do apologize for that. But from memory, and I was in. Um, the recruitment and placement committee in my in my university at NEJS. So we saw these applications open up between the latter half of June until early August. Um, and each firm has its own sort of specific um, application process. But broadly speaking, there tend to be three steps. So the first is you fill out a form and the form can be of you know it can be different kinds of things it can have a number of questions the ano form currently i believe has only three or four questions um you then tend to have various tests so you might have a watson blazer test which is something i believe linklaters does or you might have something which ano does which is a situational judgment test and that's basically a test where you you know you're put in different situations and they see how you would react um and then once you finish that first round of say forms or tests you then have an interview stage um which again varies from firm to firm um i when i sat for the interview in 2016 i think it was in 2016 um there were two there were two stages in the ano interview so one was the hr interview where you interview with someone from the graduate recruitment team. And the other phase of the interview is where um, it's a technical interview, basically, where you sit with um, a partner and you're given a case study and you have to basically answer a few questions and it's and raise diligence issues um, when you know you go through that case study. And it's, it's actually quite an interesting exercise to do um and i'll probably talk about that a little bit more subsequently um so yeah that that's the second sort of stage and normally i, I think um I, I believe herbert smith has another stage which is the group discussion stage i'm not entirely sure but um they tend to have a, they tend to have two interview stages so you have your application form filling stage. You then have a telephone interview, and then on the on the final day, you have you know you have two partners come in um, and interview you. I think, and a lot of this is going to change now. But when I obviously when I sat for the interview, um, both ANO and HSF used to come down to various universities and interview. Um, and that isn't to say that the people who were um, the people who were allowed to apply for these positions had to be from those universities. It was more that's absolutely not the case. 
it was more just a case of this being a convenient venue uh, to interview. Um, Linklaters, I believe, is one firm which contain, which interviews only in one center, so in Mumbai. Um, I believe ANO is has also also switched to that model as of last year. So everyone is sort of flown down to Mumbai, and um, the interview is carried out in a hotel over here. Um, I think it's interesting to see how this will change or will continue, um, you know, post the pandemic. So it will be, I think it'll be quite interesting just to understand what the application process will look like and whether there'll be a different, whether the, the emphasis on certain things will be different or not. And, um, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of good material out there, which I would highly encourage you to read, um, you know, when, if, you, if and when you get the opportunity to. Um, and in terms of how to actually go about the application, so now what typically, so there's two ways to do this. And in, at least in NEJS, what would happen is the RPC has a relationship with, um, with these firms. So these firms would get in touch with us at, you know, or usually over the summer, um, letting us know that they they either want to visit or they're interested in seeking out applications. And typically the RPC would then, you know, distribute this sort of application link to the relevant batch. And from there you'd take it forward and you'd let the students apply. Um, however, that's not to say that this is the only way that this process goes proceeds. So the application link actually is open to everyone and it's literally just a link on the internet. Um, for Alan and Ovi, it's aograduate.com and you can check it out. It's a very, it's a very nice website. It's very inf informative and you'll get, you know, you get different perspectives from different people, um, about the chain, about the application process, about the vacation scheme, and it's quite a range of people as well. So, right from, you know, um, trainees who haven't yet joined, to I think there's a couple of senior associates as well. So it's it's quite nice to get that range of perspective. Um, so yeah, that that's really the process to apply. In terms of what the application is about, so I will speak primarily from um, the a &O application point of view, um, but this does broadly apply to the, at least the other two as well at the moment um, in terms of what they expect. So I think when you're filling out the application, now it's, I think what you need to keep in mind is academics are important, but they're definitely not the be all and end all. Um, what I mean, and, and what good grades will show is that you have, you know, you have discipline, you have academic rigor, you, that you are able to, you know, sit down and study, which is when you're, when you're studying law, when you're practicing law is an important facet, but it's, I, I mean, I mean, I, I, I put myself in this category. I didn't have the best grades when I applied. Um, there were people with far better grades who did apply. And, you know, there are certain things which I think firms look out for, which can help offset that. Um, and I'll, I'll come to that in a little bit, but I just want to encourage you that, you know, if you, if you have great grades, by all means, go apply. That's going to give you a huge advantage. If you think your grades aren't that great, it really doesn't matter because there's a number of ways to offset that. And you should be able to, you know, present your application in such a way that it still comes across as um, you know, something as, as, as an individual who they would like to interview and maybe, um, invite for their some or invite for their, their vacation schemes. Um, so yeah, the application process tends to have a number of questions which are designed to look at, you know, a number of your personality traits. Um, and as well as something which is quite hard to define really, but something called commercial awareness. Um, and to be very honest, I still don't have a definition for it. Uh, but broadly speaking, it's 
it's understanding how the law interacts with um you know your with business really and what i guess the way you would look at this is by understanding that the firms which come down to hire are really these are are, are global international firms with you know ano for example has 40 plus offices across the world um and the businesses they um they provide their services to are also also tend to be companies with a multinational presence mm-hmm. and which are some of the biggest corporates or biggest banks across the world um so what they're looking for really is they want to un- um, what they they want to understand is how you can apply the legal knowledge and the skills you have to these commercial problems and commercial decision decisions which face um these institutions on you know a daily basis and i think that that's the that's the most challenging part of the application process it's not always easy to um sort of understand that the reason being quite simply that it's not something we're taught in a classroom um and i i do think personally that it is something which um there should be there should be greater emphasis on that in classrooms um at any js we i was lucky enough that we had some very very good teachers who did help with this but you know it it's not it's not every every time that you can always have that fortune of having a teacher who will take a take a extra step um to sort of basically give you an understanding of the ropes so it's um you know at some level it does it it's a skill you have to really um build up as well and you know there there's there's plenty of avenues to do it um or over the internet or in your in your law school library or just you know like like by watching a movie or a tv show honestly so you know it's it's very it's very accessible is what i want to highlight um so so yeah that that's really the first stage of the application where you fill out this form um the one thing i would encourage you to do uh when filling out this form is try and bring your personality out in the form and by that i mean you know your hobbies your interests um why you you might want to pursue a legal career in london straight out of law school and you know just just a few things like that and the reason i mentioned this is because at the end of the day you are going to be working in an office in um with a number of people and you know you want to be someone who can get along with people you want to be someone who people uh, and who you can have you can hold up an interesting conversation and the best way to do that really is by just you know having a few hobbies having a few interests which can be which can be as simple as you know for me personally something as simple as football um i've always watched and played football so i actually mentioned that in my form um music is another um huge passion for me um and again that's something else i mentioned in my form so you know and i i i and in fact this these are things which came up in my interview as well so i think it does go to show that uh they actually pick out these things and will ask you questions based on this um so that that's one tip i guess which um can help your application stand out and it also i think adds a level of authenticity to your application the other thing i would heavily encourage is um to make sure that you research the firm um you are applying for and it's you know sort of having worked at ano now for 3 years it's a lot easier for me to sit here and say like ano is very different from link letters or from hsf um but that you know I, and i remember when i was filling out the forms in law school that it's hard to really um pick out any differences between the firms and i mean the best way to do this is you just have to talk to people who have um have had some experience in working with these firms um you know so uh, uh, in transactions where these firms are involved um be that as an associate in india or who are people who have actually worked in these firms 
And you know, if you can highlight these differences and why you would, and in, in your head frame the question is why you would want to join ANO ahead of Linklaters or ahead of HSF. That that those are the once you start answering those questions for yourself, your application can really stand out. And um, you know, those are the questions. I think once you once you're addressing those questions in your head, you're really your your application is going to be a good one. So that that's really the application stage, um, and you know, I think I'm just trying to remember if there's any tips I can think of. Which um, I mean, I, I was I will just add this that there are a huge number of resources online, um, and to the extent where it is, it can come to the point where you tend to be drowned out by the number of resources and it's a lot of noise at times. But you know, just have a look, see what is out there. And you know, different things work for different people, honestly. So try and figure out what works for you the best and just put that, you know, have a look, have a read of that. Um, and make make use of it in your application. I guess the final thing I might like to add is, you know, watch stuff which um, will have, you know, a link to the stuff you're doing. Um, so, I mean, the most obvious example is something like, um, you know, the Wolf of Wall Street or um, the Big Short, which is actually a great documentary. So, you know, that, that helps you understand basic finance concepts, which can be really helpful in an interview. And generally, when you go ahead, if you're, if you're seeking a your career in commercial law, generally when you go ahead as well. But even other stuff, right? Like, so, I mean, if you're watching something, um, you know, like, for example, if you're watching, if you watch football and, and there's a new sponsorship deal, the chances are that one of these firms would have actually acted on that sponsorship deal. You know, if you're what, if you're, um, you know, if you're looking at, if, like a, like I think Tiffany's is just being bought out by Louis Vuitton, for example, you know, and I, I can't remember who, but there's a there's a raft of firms acting on this stuff. So keep keep in um keep in tune with all this all these news items and you know have a look it, it, things which interest you really um because that's the best way to start to build your commercial awareness as it's called. Um so yeah that, that's really the application stage. Then it goes to the interview stage. Um and again, I'll I'll speak from my experience with the A N O one. I only did get selected for um, the Alan Rovery interview, not not the others, um, which I guess goes to show that I did do my research for A N O, but not so much for links or H stuff. Um, and I think the first thing you need to keep in mind is that with A N O, at least, there's two there's two very different interviews. There's one, the H R interview, and that's why you want to. be bringing out the fact that you will be happy to work in uh, London or I believe Hong Kong is the other destination um, or Singapore maybe um, and is some you're someone who can actually really get along with people you want to communicate that you want to communicate this you also want to communicate certain other facets of your personality so you want to show that you're someone who's intellectually curious you do like to find out what's going on you do like to understand the commercial decisions behind various um, uh, you know various events in the world and you know you, you do need to have an interest beyond just the what I would say is can sometimes become an academic interest in the law um, and this is just stuff you can honestly you can you can cultivate you know by through the various examples I just mentioned a short while earlier um, so that in the HR interview as such, that's the stuff you want to be bringing out. Um, I remember one of the things which um, one of my seniors actually mentioned to me before I, I sat for this interview, and I think is, is one of the best tips I have honestly ever received, um, was it's an interview technique, really. And he said that, you know, I remember when I spoke to him, he said that there's basically two types of um, HR, of interview, of HR, our interview questions. The first is, you know, they tend to just bring out, it's more about just talking about yourself and explaining why you did certain things. 
And the second type of interview questions are those questions where the, the interviewer is really looking for an example uh, from you know, your life and how you adjust that particular situation. So you know, a, a, one, of, one of the most standard questions you'll get is uh, like, for example, what is your weakness? Um, and, you know, the interviewer doesn't really care. I mean, everyone has weaknesses. It's normal, right? The interviewer doesn't really care about that. What they're looking to see is, you know, they want a situation where you did, where, where something came up, um, you didn't respond to it very well, but you learned something from it. And they want to see how you would respond to that or a similar situation going forward. And the way you would answer these kind of questions, these sort of situational based questions on most of this acronym called STAR. Um, which is situation, task, action, and result, um, result and response, sorry. So, you know, if you just follow that acronym, you get a good structure to bring out to your questions um, when you're in an interview situation, basically. So, you know, try if you can try and mold your interview, uh, your response structures in such a way, I think that can be really helpful um, going forward. I think the other thing about uh, HR interviews, and I, I think, you know, sometimes it's 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 not always easy to do this, but the more conversationally you can keep it, the more confident you seem. And a very simple way to do this is just by sometimes asking the interviewer a question. And of course, it's it's not always appropriate to do this. However, I think in vacation scheme interviews, especially in HR on the in the HR part fit. Um, the interviewers tend to be a little more receptive towards questions. And I think not only does it appear more conversational, but it also gives you a few seconds to just, you know, gather your thoughts, take a deep breath and, you know, carry on with the interview. It can be a tiring process, especially because, um, you know, interviews can be can go on for an hour or so. Um, so it's, it's never that easy to just, you know, <laughs> be grizzled like that for, um, 45 minutes to an hour. So, you know, feel free to ask one or two questions every now and then. If nothing, just catch your breath and, you know, gather your thoughts. Um, and I guess that brings me to the, like, the assessment part of the, well, the technical part of the interview, I guess, um, which for me was um, who, uh, so at the time, Mr. Jonathan Brain, who was the chairman of the India Group, um, Ariano, he's now sort of moved on to become the, um, he's now the head of the, like the legal innovations incubator at Ariano Fuse, but he was the India chairman a few years ago and he, and he used to come down to these interviews every year. Um, so it was, it was quite daunting really, having him sort of sat opposite me. And so basically what you get is you get this case study, which is really like a due diligence report. And you need to identify red flags in it and present your um, thoughts on um, on this merger, which is about to take place. And you know the the main thing, and it, there's there's a lot of good preparation material for this as well online. Main thing you want is you want structure when you're presenting this, so you don't get your thoughts muddled up. There also tend to be some other questions at the back, um, which you're supposed to answer, but a chunk, the, the main chunk of it is identifying red flags. And this is where you sort of really apply your commercial awareness. And again, it's, it's not, it's not stuff which you don't know about. Um, you know, it's, it's basically, it, it is stuff which, you know, if, if you, if you look at, um, if you look at an, at, a, at an M&A deal, there are certain things you would be able to flag. Um, which would raise alarm bells in your head or anyone's head, right? And so that's where really applying um, your sort of your commercial awareness and all the things you might have read or all the things you've seen, you know, what sets off um, uh, red flags in your head. The one tip I, well, the two tips I would really have for this phase of um, the interview is first of all, um, make sure you have good structure. Like I said this a few moments ago, but I cannot emphasize enough how, you know, just 
keep having various heads in your mind or in your head um, about um, you know the different kinds of problems that could come up. So, say employment, um, loads, uh, operational problems, licenses, trademarks. You know the whole um, IP, uh, other IP issues, um, political issues, sanctions, all of that kind of stuff. You know these. If you can just have heads for each of these, it helps you organize your thoughts a lot better. Um, and the other thing which you should try when you're when you're doing this is just keep in mind current events across the world. Um, you know, so hypothetically, if you were to be well, you've had COVID this year, so you know that's always a good talking point. But um, you know, something like um, you know, if you've heard of a particular country which has liberalized a certain sector, um, you know. That that can always be a good thing to talk about in your technical interview, uh, because it shows that you're just in touch with commercial stuff across the world. Um, and the other thing I would really encourage you to do is um, getting used to financial terms, um, and if possible, if possible, um, I'm someone who still doesn't have a very good sense of this, but um, having an understanding of accounts, really, um, you know, basic balance sheet stuff. Um, and, and this is not easy. It's, I, I don't think it's something law schools typically teach. Um, and I was um, a humanities student in my sort of 11th and 12th. So it's not something I learned in school either. And I kind of wish I had at some point. But um, it, it, I think it'll hold you in really good stead, not just for a vacation scheme application process, but more generally uh, after that as well. Um, so, you know, get used to finance terms, understand how finance works. Uh, and I think that that's probably the best thing you can do for this whole process, honestly. Um, see, I don't have a lot of time, so I'll try and sort of go through a few points quickly. Abhishek, can I just check how much time I have? I've left. Yep. So, um, Aditya, actually, we don't really have any time limit. So, you can go on for however long it takes you to cover the pointers. All right. Sure. Thank you. Great. Okay. I mean, I guess, uh, I mean, is there anything else you want me to cover about the application process or uh, should we leave that to questions? All right. Sure. So, um, actually, I think I have only one question as such with respect to the application process. If I understand correctly, um, Alan and Overy in their VAC scheme application process, unlike HSF and Linklater's, actually ask you to submit a complete CV, right? Like uh, a two page CV that you're supposed to attach. So, just some general tips with respect to maybe how you should present your CV and maybe what all should actually be on it. Okay, that's interesting. So, um, thanks for that. I actually, so when I filled out the form, they didn't have this step. Um, so I guess it's something they've recently introduced. Uh, the first thing about CVs is they, I mean, make sure that you keep them as concise as possible. Like they have to, if it's two pages, they shouldn't exceed two pages. Um, the other tip I would give uh, is, you know, and I think something which speaks to the strength of the Indian legal education system is the number of internships students do um, across, um, you know, across like literally from from NGOs to uh, litigation internships to corporate firm internships. Um, there's quite a gamut of things you you end up doing, but when you put out pointers in your CV, I think it it helps if you mention which sector you worked in. Um, and the reason for that is it, it just shows that you have a little bit of commercial understanding of what grounds that, that sector. So, you know, I mean, just, you know, a, an easy example of this would be, say you worked in, I don't know, you worked in a capital markets team in, in a law firm. Um, you could probably say something like helped with the due diligence on an IPO in a company in the, I guess, the gems and jewelry sector, for example. Or you know, if you worked with an NGO in you know in a 
conflict zone, for example. That's not really a sector thing, but you are talking about a pretty important experience where you would have learned a lot of things, and at the very least, so how, to, how to react to crisis. So make sure you mention, you know, if when, when you're filling out, um, when you're submitting that CV, make sure you mention things which can bring out that commercial understanding um, in, um, you know, in your CV, really. And I think the, the other thing which is helpful is try and bring out as much international exposure as you can. Uh, and that doesn't mean that you have to have gone for a moot or something like that, but it means that, you know, you are engaged with, I guess, the world as a global community rather than in a more sort of localized sense, because at the end of the day, um, these firms are international firms and it's it, to them it's important that, you know, you have a more global outlook. So I guess that that that's a, that's a couple of tips which I can um, give you on the CV bit at least. All right. Um, I, I think I do have one more question actually with respect to the application process. So another thing that um, a lot of students do think is that you know the rank or let's say your GPA is extremely extremely important when you're applying for wax schemes. So I have two questions for this. One, how important do you actually think it is? And two, is there any way that a student with, let's say, a comparatively lower rank could, you know, uh, balance it out to still actually have a chance for these kind of wax games? Look, I mean, as with most things in life, academics isn't unimportant. And it does, it, it always helps to have good grades. Um, but for vacation schemes, I, that, that's definitely not the case. Um, like I said, I, I wasn't someone who had the best grades in law school. Um, and the way, I mean, the way you want to be looking at this is they do have a minimum cutoff, um, which, and it's on, they don't really have, um, you know, they, in, in, they've, they've sort of compared it to the UK, which is you need a two is to one, which I think is, 65% and above in your overall um, grade, um, you know, and that will obviously um, translate to different law schools very differently. So that's your minimum cutoff. As long as you meet that, you should be, you're eligible to apply. Beyond that, I think what really counts is, you know, in the fact that you have a well-rounded application. So you might be, you might be brilliant at academics, but if you don't have things showing enough you know, exposure to international exposure or sufficient um, you know, extra uh, ex uh, exposure to extracurriculars, I don't think that that's a very good application personally. Um, and I guess the best way to offset that, uh, and this is just another thing which I, I would you know, urge everyone to keep in mind, is that when you do extracurriculars, make sure you bring out the international aspect if there is one on them or the commercial aspect of what you've learned and by that i mean you know it isn't enough to say that oh i wrote xyz paper or i went for xyz moot because at the end of the day what really counts is what you learned from that process and how you can apply it in your everyday job when you do if and when you do, um, do a, if and when you do end up working at um you know at ano um and the networks you build when you go for like a moot, a sports tournament, or a debate, and how you can sort of really apply this. Um, the one thing I will encourage is um, that you know organization skills are are looked at very very favorably. So if you help organize fests, or if you help organize any sort of events, make sure you mention that because you know there there, there are a number of challenges in putting these things together. So yeah, I, I think that that that's you know these are just examples of things which can help sort of offset your um, relatively not very good grades, um, but grades by by no means the be all and end all um, when applying for a vacation scheme. And I mean, I, I'd just like to you know sort of end this question, uh, this response by saying that at the end of the day, it's it's really a it's a free application process where you have nothing to lose. Um, so, you know, by all means, just go ahead and apply. 
uh, and you know, if nothing, you will learn a few things about yourself and you will um, basically, you know, it'll be your first step in before your, you know, your day zeros and your PPOs and other internships sort of start in just understanding what you really want. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, just go ahead and apply. Yep, I think that's it from my side with respect to the application process. Um, I think that does bring us to the next stage. If you might want to talk about anything with respect to opportunities post or during a vacation scheme. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about my experience there as well. Um, just very briefly, and I, I will caveat this by saying that again, each firm has its own sort of program and how they run it. Um, with the NO, you tend to you have you have three windows when you can actually go to the firm, um, and of course, with the pandemic, it's I think it's been moved to a virtual program. But there's the spring one, which I think is in March. There's um, the summer one, which is in July, and that's for two weeks, and there's the winter one, which is in December for a week. And vacation schemes are a little bit different while they're similar to intern like in internships in Indian corporate law firms in that you know you go to an office you have to you have to do some work you have to impress they're a little bit different in that the emphasis on work is is not perhaps not as much as um as it is in corporate law firms in India where I mean as an intern you can you have to do a lot of <laughs> heavy lifting at times but the emphasis is very much, and I remember some another senior who told me this actually, um, and he used this phrase, he, he called it an extended interview. And I think that's a great way to look at it. So when you go there, it's it's an interview for two weeks, which can be um, daunting, but it's something which can be really, really helpful as well. And you know, it'll help you understand the nature of the firm if it's something that is that you want to do and if, it's the space which you think you'll be able to achieve, um, you know, what what you set out to achieve. So it's a little bit, it's not identical to an internship, but it is similar. The other thing which, you know, I mean, the people there, honestly, in my experience, have been absolutely lovely. Um, they're all very warm and welcoming. Um, and, you know, this, this has happened at various stages, be it at my vacation scheme when I went for two weeks um, and it's my training contract and you know the people I met in my cohort and subsequently the team I've joined which is leverage finance team at every stage they've been absolutely wonderful um, you know and very welcoming and I think that that's really important because at the end of the day you want to be in a workspace which you feel comfortable in um, so I I mean you know don't let don't don't ever be sort of be set by that doubt that um, you might not quote unquote fit in because trust me, there's like you will you will always find like minded people around you. Um, and I guess the sort of coming back to the question which Abhishek raised, which was on the opportunities you have after completing a vacation scheme. So the vacation scheme is primarily sort of it's calibrated towards ensuring that you well not ensuring but providing you a platform to get a training contract with the firm a large number of vac scheme applicants tend to um the conversion rate is actually quite high and you know the what at least what happened with ANO is you sit in a department for two weeks in summer and you so you're you're sat with a junior associate, um, and they sort of take you to the paces and they assess you. And there's a whole like there's a whole raft of um, team building exercises, which um, you know again you're sort of assessed on to make sure that uh, you know you have the things they're looking out for really. Um, and once you're done with the VAC scheme, what happens is some firms tend to have another interview. Um, I think Linklater has this, but with ANO, it's you just you get to know. I think within the span of two or three weeks, whether you um, are going to get a training contract, and the training contract is 
sort of more similar to what you would uh, call a gen general internship over here in that you train with the firm for two years over various departments. And at the end of the two years, you have an option of, um, you know, you can either stay on with the firm, usually in one of the departments you trained in, uh, which makes you an offer. Or if you would want, you can always switch firms um, to any of the, the other firms. And, or you can sort of, you can, you know, if you'd like, you can always come back to India. If you feel that, you know, you'd want to do something different in India, or you just want to practice law as um, um, a commercial lawyer in India instead. So the possibilities of, I mean, a permanent job, so as to speak, after a vacation scheme are the, like they're endless. And really at, at the end of the day, what really happens after a vacation scheme is you're made an offer and to you know, take up the training contract. And it's entirely your decision to make um, as to whether you want to go ahead and spend the next two years of your, or the first years of your professional career um, in one of these firms. Um, and I think regardless of whether you decide to go ahead with it or not, I think it, it's a wonderful experience just because of the exposure um, and the different sort of aspects of the law you see. Uh, I personally sat in the, um, the arbitration group at that time in summer 2017 and I helped with some investor state dispute stuff. Um, and I mean, to those of you who are familiar with this, it's not, you know, it's something which is now making more and more inroads into India, but you know, at the time, and I, and still for that matter, I don't think there are a lot of firms which have an active investor state dispute um, practice uh, in, in, their, in their sort of setup. So that was very cool to see for me. And uh, again, for me personally, I've done a moot, I've done a moot court competition um, involving this area of law. So I was quite sort of interested in how this actually played out in um, in you know the real world, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I mean, bottom line, there, there's plenty of opportunities, um, and you can easily convert to a to get a training contract after you're done with your back scheme. All right. Yep. I I think that does bring me towards probably the end of this session. I think one of the last questions that I would want to ask you before we actually part is that since since this is something that you actually start working towards only let's say towards the end of your third year, what would you say are certain things that you should definitely put off by the time you reach the end of third year to ensure that you'll actually have a decent chance at a wax scheme, or at least just to keep your options open? Um. Look, I don't think there's any formulaic way to really do it because, you know, I'm, I mean, I could, I could sit here and tell you that you should do X, Y, Z and that'll definitely get you a VAC scheme. Um, I don't think it works like that. And I um, sort of have, um, you know, I'm thinking back to the sort of people who, uh, who are doing, who are the Chinese in London or, or associates. Um, and I don't think there's a set formula. What I will say is this, right? So first thing is, it is, like I said, you know, it, grades are not the be all and end all of it, but they're important and they do help. So don't completely, um, you know, hammer up your grades in your first few years. Make sure that you reach that baseline. Um, it is important. Beyond that, what I think really helps is if you do certain activities which have an international flavor to them or they have, pardon me, or they have a commercial flavor to them, and I'll give you examples of both. Um, so in terms of an international flavor, you, you know, moot court competitions are something which I think, it, I mean, those are quite popular in India. Um, and I, this doesn't mean that it has to be something whereby you have to go abroad, but something which gives you, which is, you know, which gives you some from some perspective on, um, on um, sort of competitions where, you have foreign teams coming to India. One of the moot court competitions which comes to my mind is, I think the DM Harish competition, which is, if I'm not mistaken, held in uh, held at uh, GLC. So you know that that that's an excellent um, opportunity to sort of get that international exposure. 
uh, debates are another example of this. And you know, they, they basically go they, they, they go to show how you can um, network and understand various ideas which guide um, your international legal sort of sector, I guess, in a sense. And uh, academic papers is another wonderful source. Um, and I would, if, if, if this is the thing you are going to choose, do try and make sure that the things you write about have an international focus rather than a purely um, domestic focus. Um, and you know, when it comes to organizational things, so if you're if you're organizing a fest or if you're organizing, um, you know, RPC events, for example, um, there are numerous times you will have to, uh, you know, coordinate and liaise with numerous people. You will have to arrange sponsorship, and these kind of commercial decisions are really really handy in sort of showcasing how, you know, you're ready for this to to basically take on. Um, um, you know, to to show that you are ready to become a commercial lawyer. So I think those are, you know, ways you can ensure that you're sort of calibrated towards um, possibly securing a vacation scheme. Yep. Um, yeah, th thanks a lot for answering that question, Aditya. And I think that also brings me to the end um, of all my questions with respect to the whole application process and a back scheme itself. Um, but there is one additional question that I want to ask you, which is probably a little off topic. Um, so could you could you talk a little bit more about the chances of actually converting a VAC scheme into a training contract, which you could join after your com after the completion of your five year LLP? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it, it it usually tends to be quite high, and it usually, you know, I think, I, I mean, uh, so let me put it this way: right? they, the students they get um, who they invite for a vacation scheme, they want you to become future trainees in the firm. Um, so you know, you have to. There's and, and there's there's two things you want to keep in mind when you're actually doing the vacation scheme. Um, you know, and if it's something you want to do going ahead, um, I, if you want to become a trainee going ahead. So the first thing is you obviously want to be good at your work. And I think that, you know, because of the, the sort of internship, well, the rigor of a lot of Indian internships, I think that does come more naturally to um, some of the Indian students, is, at least is in my very limited experience. But the thing that can be a little bit difficult is sort of being someone who, who can be outgoing, who can go up to, you know, people who are, who, frankly speaking, are from a completely different cultural background and being personable. And that, that can take some doing. So that, that's the one skill, I think, which you need to put heavy emphasis on, um, just because it's not sometimes the most natural thing which comes to, um, you know, people uh, at, at these things. And I, I guess you know we we do think that sometimes just doing a great job um doing a great technical job as such can is enough to get a job but um you need to make sure that not only are you very good at your work but you're also someone who can go out, go around speak to people network really um and i know that's a <laughs> that's a very tricky word to use but yeah i mean it's just network and ensure that you um soak as much as you can of the professional culture of the workplace, really. But yeah, I mean, as such, if you were to really just stack it up in terms of numbers, I think the numbers do look very good generally for vacation scheme students wanting to do training contracts and more so for um, uh, for Indian students who go on vacation schemes. Thank you for answering that, Aditya. And yes, that I think brings me to the close of this session. So I would just like to take this opportunity once again to thank you on behalf of Team Plant for taking out the time for this session. Trust me when I say that this session has been very, very useful and it's going to help a lot of students who are going to actually view this session and then accordingly make better applications to ANO. So thanks a lot once again. I hope so. No problem at all, Abhishek. And thanks a lot again for having me. It's been, uh, it's been a pleasure.